Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for our third Thursday live video chat. It is October, and today we are talking about drugs and alcohol because October is Substance Abuse Prevention Month. So my name is Gabby, joined here as always with Boys Town Common Sense Parenting Expert Bridget Barnes. Bridget, how's it going today? Well, it's a little chilly where I'm at. I don't know about the rest of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like it's so chilly, especially when I'm up in the morning. It's so, so cold and then it gets a little warmer throughout the day. But yeah, I'm right yeah. there with you. <laughs> awesome. Well, we are going to go through several discussion questions today for Bridget on how to talk to your children about drugs and alcohol, if they experiment with with those substances, what to do, prevention, all of those things. So if you are watching live and you have a question for Bridget and want to ask, go ahead and drop that in the comment section of this video and we can get it answered at the end. And if you're watching later on, make sure you give this video a like and feel free to always message our inbox and we can get you the help and resources that you may need. So let's hop right into these discussion questions, Bridget. The first one is about what age do kids typically start experimenting with or being around drugs and alcohol? Yeah, I ran a little search on this. Mm -hmm. and I found that the average age for first marijuana uh, use is around age 14. Mm -hmm. And uh, alcohol uh, use is earlier around age 12 on oh. average. That's not every kid, but we're just right. doing averages here. So... Uh, a little later for marijuana, a little earlier for um, for alcohol. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you just mentioned both of those, alcohol and marijuana. Mm -hmm. Are those the substances that most kids are typically right. first most, being exposed mm -hmm. to? Okay. Yeah. On average. I mean, I'm sure depending on where you're at in the country, mm -hmm. where there might be um, more pill use or, you know, amphetamines or wherever the area is, kids are exposed to different things more so than other. But on average across the country, marijuana and alcohol are more accessible. Uh, and so that's that's the number that I came up with in the one most often uh, reported. So when approaching this subject with kids, of course, we know, you know, this isn't a one time conversation. I'm going to sit down with my kids and you know, it's like the sex talk with drugs and alcohol. We're going to give them a talk. It's definitely a conversation that is ongoing, but maybe for those parents that haven't talked with their kids about this yet, what are some main points that you think would be important to emphasize in bringing this up? Well, I like to use the kiss effect. So <laughs> keep it age appropriate. Okay. Uh, and the uh, I in that kiss is to identify what the rules and the responsibilities, you know, and the reasons for those rules are letting kids know what are the rules? Why do we have these? What are the reasons for that? And what is your responsibility in regards to those rules? Then the S stands for just like, you know, speak with and not at children about drug and alcohol uh, and on a consistent basis. Um, and then the last S just you know, a safe place uh, to provide them support. Kids need to know that they can talk to you, right? So uh, if you kind of use that approach, I think that you'll uh, have a better chance of talking to kids, especially as uh, kids in high school are exposed to uh, drugs, are commonly exposed to marijuana, alcohol around that age group and with friends. Uh, so, you know, keeping that age appropriate, identify the rules, the reasons for those rules and responsibilities, you know, speak with kids on a consistent basis and give them a safe place to talk to you. That's, they don't feel judged. Yeah. What tips do you have for keeping that open line of communication? You know, let's say we've talked about it with the kids a few times in middle school, but you know, maybe for this kid, they haven't really been around it, but then in high school, it starts becoming more prevalent. How can we keep this conversation going? Well, I think, you know, having that open door uh, <laughs> is important. And not just about drugs and alcohol. Just don't just talk about that. Uh, yeah. But ha talk about what's going on in their lives. Who are they? How they feel? What are their experiences? Um, 
and, and, you know, talk to them about those things. So then they'll feel more comfortable talking to you about drugs and alcohol and, and things like that. I think it's important uh, to avoid lecturing children. Uh, they seem to have a little switch in their head that as soon as you start lecturing, that's when they click that off. Mm -hmm. They yeah. stop listening. And so I tend to uh, talk to young people uh, with more questions. I mean, true questions and asking them their feelings, their viewpoint, their experiences, their challenges, and sharing that as well, kind of a swinging door, not just, I'm just not peppering them with questions and things like that, but we're sharing a moment and to avoid lecturing because that kind of brings, a bon uh, brings about contentious communication, which kids feel like, well, I don't ever want to experience that again. That seems like a battle every time she talks to me about drugs and alcohol. So they try to avoid us. Right. So I think that, you know, kids will learn over time that they can come to you when you have that open door policy, when you avoid lecturing and ask more questions and have more conversations about their feelings and, you know, their point of view. And then, um, and letting children uh, maybe have a fail safe if they don't feel comfortable coming to you to talk to a trusted adult, one that you trust, that you trust, and you can depend on them to um, talk to your children and lead them back to you. That's that trusted person. Not just they keep all the information to themselves. I mean, every time my niece would talk to me. I would tell her, you know, I'm going to talk to your mom about this too. And we can talk together to her about it. Uh, and she knew that going in, but she knew yeah. that I was going to listen and, and hear her. And, and I think that was her way of getting to her mom is to go through me uh, mm -hmm. so she would be able to have me there <laughs> as well. So I think that um, having those kind of fail safe people also is helpful for, you know, conversations when you struggle with communicating with your kid. Yes, that's definitely great advice. So we had one parent write in with a good question. She's asking, how can I explain the importance of substance abuse to my kids and what it can do to their futures? Assuming it's not in, like you said, like a lecturing tone, just a discussion mm -hmm. like we've talked about. She said, I've tried talking about how it will negatively impact their schoolwork, sports, friendships, et cetera but my kids aren't really seeming to care much about what I say. They're just like, yeah, okay, mom, you know, we get it. I'm worried that they will experiment in high school and want to make sure that they understand the consequences of substance use. Yeah. Well, she doesn't sound unlike most parents who have said yeah. the same thing uh, about these talks that they have with their children about the negative outcomes of substance abuse. And you have to remember that most kids are probably magical thinkers. That stuff doesn't happen to them. Or some of them might be born limit testers, while others are too trusting of their peer group. And so my best advice when talking to these different personalities is that um, when you talk about drugs and alcohol with your kids, uh, give them the facts, just the facts, or have them find the facts. I've had my son when he was younger find the facts, go online, let's find out what this drug will do to you. <laughs> and he would tell me, well, let it do this and that and the other. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm learning some things here. So he was telling me versus me lecturing him. Um, don't go on and on about the horrors of, uh, of drugs and alcohol. Kids tend to tune that out too. I tend to focus on alternative lifestyle. If a kid mm -hmm. is uh, finding alternatives to do, versus focusing on the fear strategy, I think that they will begin to focus on what's important, like, you know, staying healthy, exercising, um, self-care, learning to advocate for oneself, cultivating a positive peer group, you know, all those kind of things, being a mentor themselves, because when you're a mentor, you tend to think about what am I doing that someone who I'm helping, you know, might be looking at. So giving them that alternative focus versus focusing always on the drugs is kind of, I don't know, Gabby, like when you were little and your mom would tell you not to touch the plug, don't go mm -hmm. over and get hurt. And then I see little kids putting their hand out toward the plug, looking back at their parent, like you see yeah. what I'm doing? See what like, makes you want to do it more. Right? Exactly, right. And so when we focus all of our attention on that plug, that plug, that plug, or in this case, 
that drug, that drug, that drug, right? Then kids are more interested in like, well, what is it about this? It gets you so worked up. Let me figure that out. So, and finally, it's not always what we say to kids. It's what we model to them. So, you know, if you find yourself popping ibuprofen or sleeping pills like they're chiclets, and if uh, when Aunt Mary comes over, she has a glass of wine every night she comes over and even more on the weekends and you don't say anything about it, your kids are watching all those things going on. And so right. that message might be even stronger than the well-crafted lecture that you have got for them on substance abuse. So uh, remember that they're watching you and they often... Um, you know, model what they see. Mm -hmm, definitely. So the next question I, I also feel like is, is a common one that we've gotten around this topic over the years, but it's relating to the friend group. So yeah. what happens when my child's friend group starts experimenting with drugs and alcohol? And, you know, maybe I don't think my kid is doing it, but it's possible they might have participated. It's a tough one because, you know, this mom writes and she's, she doesn't want her kid to, you know, not have any friends if the whole friend group is doing it. But again, at the same time, are those really the people that you want to be friends with? So I'm interested to hear what you think about that. I think you, you and I have both been in a situation. Oh, yeah. I right. was in this in high, and when I was in high school. It was the same thing. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Those friends, those friends are everywhere. Are they not? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so you, there's lots of friend groups in high school. There's lots of friend groups in elementary school. There's lots of friends everywhere. And you get choices of what group you're going to gravitate to. Right. And so just saying that's their only choice is not a true, that's not a truism, right? It, you know, no. I would probably limit and control my child's access to that particular that group. Uh, yeah, friend group. Like I, you know, would they need to be over here? I need to know where you're at. You know, you're not going to go to this party open, you know, <laughs> that I don't know any of the people involved in that. So there's going to be limitations and it's going to be a little bit more control for that particular friend group. And then I'm going to encourage my child to uh, make new friends, <laughs> develop new group, a uh, new group of friends who yeah. are less needy yeah. <laughs> and more supportive. You know, and that's just, I mean, that's a skill that I think is applicable to so much beyond this topic is you shouldn't even be just in one friend group. You know, it's mm -hmm. good to be friendly with multiple groups of people and, you know, everyone in the class. So then if you are in the, one of these situations, then, you know, you're not like left in the dust and you don't have other options of friends to hang out with. Yeah. I mean, when I was younger, like you, and I knew some people that were in that friend group, yeah. you know. And they were like, hey, Bridget. And I, was like, I spoke to them, hey, how you doing? And they're like, hey, come on over here. I said, oh, let me get you later. And then I would never come back. <laughs> right. Yeah. And or I'm, I'll hang out with you at school, but, you know, maybe yes. Friday, Saturday night, I'm doing something else. Exactly. So you just know and teaching kids how to navigate those friend groups. Mm -hmm. And the peer pressure of it, too, yes. is so hard, especially exactly. in high school. It's like, well, if I don't do this, are they going to, you know, am I going to be a total outcast? But that's definitely not the case. You just have to. Help your kid find their group. That's and they might be an outcast of that group, and maybe yeah. rightfully so. Maybe that's just right. not their people. You know, they yeah. have to find their people, and so if they are the outcast, maybe that's the way that should be. So, mm -hmm. yeah, wasn't meant to be as right. a friend anyway. Right. Um. The next question is, oh, this is an interesting one. What should I do if I know that another parent is providing alcohol for kids? So like you said, you know, a lot of high school, you know, my husband's, his kids are, or his siblings are in high school right now. So we have frequent conversations with them about this, but mm -hmm. you know, when they're like, oh, there's a huge party going on at so-and-so's house and, you know, mm -hmm. she couldn't go cause she had dance, but you know, she heard that, you know, Sally's parents were the ones providing alcohol. Like mm -hmm. as a parent, what do you do in that situation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess my my thinking here is it is never, no, not ever, okay to provide alcohol or allow children access to alcohol and drugs. Right. It is against the law. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now that we have that cleared up, yes. I think the answer becomes clear. It's against the law. Yeah. So 
I would report people who, you know, whether it's my kid or somebody else's kid, I would hate for those kids to get in the car and uh, everybody gets killed and we go to the funeral. We know good and well, Cindy and John down here were, you know, providing that. What do we think is going to happen? Yeah. So if I just sit by and let, if I saw some kid playing in the street, I probably wouldn't just say, oh, that's not my problem. His right. mother's there. I would probably, you know, get some help. So yeah. my thing is obviously somebody needs to get some help. And if, you know, they're grown, they know what the laws are. They know what they're doing uh, is against the law. So that's my take on it. Some other people might have another take, but it is the law. I want everybody to be aware of that. That right. you, can't, you know, you can't just give children alcohol. It's on all of us, you know, yeah. to protect, protect our kids. So I'm with you on that. Even Pretty their clear. kids. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Clear cut answer there. Okay. So we just have a few more questions here for Bridget. So if you're watching live and you have a question on this topic, now would be the time to leave it in the comment section so we can get it answered in time. Okay. So the next one is if I know that, well, I'll preface it. We've talked a lot about prevention so far and talking about, you know, if my kid were to do this, now the questions are kind of going to go into if they already have or whatnot. So this one says, if I know my child has used substances before, how do I talk to them about discontinuing use, stopping, let's say, you know, they've been caught with alcohol in their room or have done marijuana over the course of a few weekends? How can we kind of stop that in its tracks? It's mm -hmm. such a hard situation. Right. So we're in the situation now. It's no, we yeah. can't prevent it. It's, it's happening to our kid. Um, so we might as well, number one, be honest. Be straightforward mm -hmm. about what has happened and, and, and what they're involved with. And not beat around the bush or act like it's not happening or that kind of thing. Because when you face it head on, then, mm -hmm. you know, and accept that this is happening, then I think you'll be better equipped to um, be able to assist your child versus pretending it might not be happening or he's all better or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. I think you have to be firm about what the rules are. So the kids know, what are my limits here? If it's sometime I can have a drink and mom doesn't say anything, or sometimes I can stumble home and smell like marijuana and nobody, you know, I get a lecture and then I go to bed and wake up and everything's the same, then uh, kids get mixed messages about what, what are the rules. I would sit down and talk to kids about respecting, not all, you know, themselves, respecting others, um, and respecting, you know, our family, you know, so respect is a big thing, especially respect for themselves or putting themselves in harm's way. I sometimes tell kids like, you know, when you take drugs, you're actually altering your psychological, your physical self. Now, if your friends told you to take your nose and move it to the side of your face, <laughs> Is that something you're willing to do? You think that's a smart move for you? Or, you know, is that, you know, but you're practically changing yourself for this drug. Have some real talks of, to your kid about that. And then take the responsibility to get help. If your child had a little cut on their finger, you put a Band-Aid on it and you go on about life as usual. If your child had a big gash in their stomach, you'd call the ambulance. If your child is involved with substance abuse and probably more than you know, the where you've caught them is what you know about, but I would get them professional help. And if it's early on, great, because we might can prevent any further problems versus just relying on a good lecture, you know, or a consequence that's going to stop this. So accepting where you're at in this process, you know, meeting it straightforward, be honest, be firm, talk about respect and take the responsibility to get some help. Mm -hmm. So if parents watching are looking to get that professional help, what resources does Boys Town offer for children who are in the midst of substance abuse? Well, you know, every time we have this talk, Gabby, I go on and gush on about Boys Town. <laughs> That's what we need. People need to know. It's true, you know, first thing, you know, in that situation, uh, and we've all, you know, when you need to get some help, it's kind of, you know, you can just start out by talking to the Boys Town Hotline. These are great folks. They'll talk to you 
about anything at any time, 24 seven, doesn't matter t- day or night. You can't call Gabby or me <laughs> at midnight. So nope. you'll wanna call the Boys Town Hotline yeah. and talk to them about what services are in your area for your kiddo. Mm-hmm. Okay? Cause they'll tell you nationwide and they're great at that. They serve thousands of people across this nation every, every all the time. So feel free to give them a call. Now, if you're in Nebraska and at some of our sites, we have a behavioral health clinic center so that you can be able to access some therapeutic support, not only for your child going through, maybe if they're involved in drugs or alcohol, but for your family that also, you go through it with your kid. You, they're not <laughs> just you know alone in this situation. So you might need individual and family therapy in regards to uh, the situation. So our behavioral health clinic is there for you as well. Um, the Boys Town Press has some great books for kids and for parents, workbooks and things like that if you just want to have some literature. But I also say come to the Boys Town Common Sense Parenting classes now that they're online and you can get them anywhere, anytime. Yeah. I would definitely use that as a resource because here's the thing that I find out, Gabby, in the classes mm-hmm. when I listen to parents talking to each other about things that they're going through. And then another parent says, well, yeah, I went through that too. And then another parent says, all right, what happened? And then they tell them and they say, well, I use this or this is what I did. And so going to not feeling alone that you're just not the only parent and also talking to other parents about what are their supports and what they could use um, can really be helpful to parents. And then Mm -hmm. of course, our Boys Town Parenting Approach is very positive and very practical, purposeful parenting. You you know, we get the job done. And so I think that would be uh, helpful to parents as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we're linking here on Facebook, all of these resources in the comment section now. So you can grab them right there below. The Boys Town National Hotline phone number is 800-448-3000. And they also have a 24-7 texting line. So that's, you text voice to 27121 and then you can text with them maybe if you don't want to talk um additionally like i always want to mention the search box on boystown.org slash parenting is always a great resource that you can dig through so even if you go up there and just search alcohol or drug as a keyword uh substance any of those will pop up and we'll pull up a full list of parenting articles and other things that we have to get you the help that you may need. So um, thank you, Bridget. You know, everything you said today, I know sometimes talking about drugs and alcohol and underage use can be kind of a taboo subject, but that's why we're here to kind of take that tabooness away from it because it is something that so, so many families deal with and we're glad to have you as a resource. Well, I know that uh, in our classes, and I work, I can remember a, a mom who was going through this very subject. It was nothing about it was easy for her. She had other children and she was struggling. Um, the thing, though, is to, you know, we try to give her support at every, you know, therapeutic support, the parenting support, the online calling someone. We got something for her son to be able to talk to other kids that were struggling with that, got him into therapy. So it was kind of like a village <laughs> kind yeah. of helping this family at, through this crisis. And they got through the crisis. She came out on the other side. So did her son. And it's just being there for people when you they need you at that point in their life. And that knowing that's not just who I am now, who I'm always going to be, but this is a struggle we're facing. This is a challenge we're facing. And that there are people out here like Boy Town that are here for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well said, well said. All right, well, we are going to wrap up today here, but we will be on next month. We only have two more monthly lives for 2022. I can't believe it. (laughs) Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for watching. Make sure you give this video a thumbs up if you found it helpful and share it with another parent who you think could benefit from this information. Thanks, Bridget. Thanks a lot, Gabby. Everybody have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.